Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, I do pray that the Lord bless you with a joyful Christmas. I pray that the peace, hope, and joy of Christmas in our Savior Jesus will dwell with you this day and each day. Please join me in prayer. We thank you, O Lord Jesus, for entering into our world as a child, for being the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation, for your being our salvation. Help us this day and each day to find joy in knowing that you are God with us, Emmanuel, the Lord who will always be with us, who will always be faithful, who will one day lead us to be with you forever. May this be our hope and our solace this day and every day. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. In the 1980s, well, 1980, I should say, I was not yet born. But I suspect that many of you were in front of a TV or at least listening to a radio on February 22nd, 1980. Maybe you don't know that date, but it is the day that the U.S. hockey team lined up against the Soviet Union's hockey team in the 1980 Olympics. Maybe if you're not familiar with that game, let me tell you a little bit about the stats. The Soviet Union's hockey team that was lining up, they were experienced players. They, some of them, were active military. They were players who had played in previous Olympics. They were again at this Olympics. They had won six out of the last seven Olympics gold medals. The only upset was in 1964 when the U.S. hockey team dealt them a, a loss. They had outscored every other team 175 to 44. That's a 4 to 1 ratio if you're doing the math. They were a powerhouse team. On the other side of the ice, you had the U.S. hockey team. They were coached by Coach Herb Brooks, who was a former college coach. He had coached at University of Minnesota and Boston University. And so most of the players on the team were made up of former players of Boston University and University of Minnesota. Average age of the team was 21. Most of the players were no names. Only one player had continued on from the 76 Olympics. Perhaps it goes without saying, the Soviets were heavily favored for this game. Well, on February 22nd, it was a Friday, 1980, the U.S. hockey team lined up against the Soviet team in a game in Lake Placid, New York, which has now been call, become called the Miracle on Ice. Because at the end of three quarters, three quarters, I'm sorry, three periods, uh, there's not quarters there, at the end of three periods, the U.S. team skated off the ice singing God Bless America. Herb Brooks ran to the locker room because his face was covered in tears as he cried in joy. And the U.S. team held their heads high because they had de defeated the Soviets 4-3. to three. It was not just one play. It was not just one great shot. It was not just one great save. But the whole game was called a miracle on ice. Now, it wasn't until two days later, February 24th, that the U.S. team ended up finally taking the gold when they defeated Finland, but this was the game. This was what was called the miracle. Al Michaels was announcing the game. He was not the one who called it that, but his co-announcer, the goalie from Canada, called it the miracle. And that's what is still known as today. Like I said, though, it wasn't just one play. It wasn't one great player. It wasn't one great shot. So often when we, with sports or even with life, we do this, don't we? We find the highlight reel, the one great player, the catch, the shot. We talk about the one great play. We remember those things. And even in our own lives we do that. We remember those, those highlights. We think about the, the time when, we, for the first time, we drove the car without mom or dad sitting next to us. The thrill, the excitement of having our own license, the independence. We think about those times when, well, when you've held your grandchild for the first time in your arms, or maybe your child for the first time in your arms. That's one of those highlights, isn't it? Those highlights when you, you think back to when your husband got down on one knee, or maybe if it was you, got down on one knee and proposed. Those words, I do, I will. You know, those things run through our minds, don't they? And this happens in, in the church as well. Maybe it's Silent Night, as you hear that played on Christmas Eve, there, there's just something about that song. Or, or maybe it's the, on, Chris, uh, on, on Easter, as, as you hear the gospel read and you hear, hear the, the, the story of Jesus' resurrection, you think to yourself, He is risen indeed, alleluia. Or maybe it's just a, a certain verse of the Bible, a chapter of the Bible, which is spoken to you in particular, 
at a time of need. And the list goes on, doesn't it? We have highlight reels that go through our lives, that the events that stand out to us. Unfortunately, we have highlights of the bad things of our lives, too. They stand out. The, that fight where you said that one thing you wish you could take back, but you'll never be able to take back. The diagnosis. Cancer. Untreatable. Terminal. Those times when you felt as though God was distant from you. When you felt like as no matter how long you prayed, no matter how many words of the sermons you listened to, it seemed like He was never speaking to you. Never had any words for you. And the list goes on, doesn't it? Sometimes it's easy to let our lives become a series of highlights. Good and bad. Highlights of the things that have happened, a series of random events. And, and we may confess that God is in control of all things, that God is the one who is in charge, but do we really believe that? We have this example of Anna and Simeon in our gospel lesson for this morning. And it, look at their remarkable faith. Both of them we know were aged. Listen to the words again of the Nunc Dimittis as Simeon was saying, Lord, now let your servant go in peace, for mine eyes have seen your salvation. We know that he was older in age. Or Anna, it tells us she was 84 years of age. Remarkable, the faith they had, the hope they had of the Savior coming, the assurance. Do you wonder, though, did they ever look at life and say, is he coming? Like so many in the Old Testament, as they looked at the Messiah, as they waited for the Messiah to come, is he coming? Did they look at life as if it was a series of one event after another? One thing to the next. So random. So chaotic. Sometimes that's how it is, isn't it? That's how the world tells us it is. If you want to change your life, you need to change your life. If you want to improve your life, you need to improve your life. You need to be master of your own destiny. Those are cliche phrases, but things that we've probably heard. Unfortunately, those are contrary Rather, fortunately, those are contrary to what God's Word says. In Matthew chapter 10, God answers those statements. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Jesus cares enough to count the cares on your head. It's not a waste of time for Him to know the number of hairs on your head, to know the number of cells in your body. For Jesus, your life is not a series of random events. For God, it is not a series of random happenstance. But for God, your life has meaning because He created you to be His child. Because He created you to be His very own. Your life has purpose. Have you ever thought about those verses? I mean, stop to think about them. Some of you probably have them memorized. You know those words that Jesus said that he knows the count of hairs on your head. But have you stopped to think about that for just a minute? To think about the fact that he knows your most intimate thoughts. That he cares to know your most intimate thoughts. The things that make you smile and giggle when you are in traffic or at the store. He knows those things. The things that make you frown and scowl or when you notice the disappointed look on your children's face at Christmas, if they didn't get exactly what they wanted. He even knows those thoughts that are opposed to him, the thoughts of distrust. And he loves you. Because you are his. Because you are his child, he loves you. And he has made you his own through adoption. He chose you. It was not just that you became part of His family, but He chose you. Listen again to the words of Paul to the Galatians. Because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. We are sons of God and daughters of God because He has made us His own. He was not willing to just leave us or the rest of creation to random happenstance or mere chance or 
well, I hope this will work out. But from the beginning, he had a plan of salvation for each one of us. From the beginning, he had an intention of how he would save us. And that was through the blood of his son. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption. God adopted us to be his children, to make us his very own. We are not here randomly or by chance. We are not here for the amusement of God. We are here because he loves us, because he cares for us. We are here because he bought us by his own precious blood. And before the foundations of the earth, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, he laid out this plan. The plan for the restoration of all of creation. God does not just have one big highlight reel, but He is there through our whole lives. He is there in the times when things are going great and the times when things are difficult. He is there when, th when we are happy and when we are sad. He is there when things are going our way and when things are not going our way. He is there in all times. For God is faithful. And He had a plan. He didn't just one day say to himself, boy, this world sure is getting to be a mess again. I better get things cleaned up. But he sent Jesus, who is the plan, who is our hope, who is our salvation. And Jesus came to be that fruition of the plan through the womb of Mary. He entered into this world so that he could teach, so that he could show us true miracles as he gave sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf as he relieved the pain of the, the back pain of those who suffered from back pain, as he gave, drove out demons, as he even raised the dead. And he gave him to be the fruition when he gave his body and blood on the cross. But Jesus was the completion of the plan when he conquered sin and death, when he conquered the devil, when he rose from the grave. And that is truly the hope we have. That is true, the hope we have at Christmas and throughout the years and throughout the days that we know our faithful God is with us, that he has given us the hope of salvation, the promise that we have purpose. We are not here by accident. I know some of you have asked at times, what is my purpose? Why am I still here? When we know that God has purpose for us, it changes our perspective. It allows us to see that each day that God gives us has reason. That even if we're three years old or 93 years old, God will still use us. Even if we're sick and bound in bed, God will use us. If we're well and able to sprint, God will use us. And how do we know God's purpose for us? Not by going to the library and finding a self-help book or finding a great guru who will give us the instructions that they think we need. But God gives us instruction in His Word. He gives us direction in His Word. And I know sometimes when we open in God's Word, some of those sayings those in the Old Testament can be pretty obscure to us, hard for us to understand. That's why we, the more we, time we spend in God's Word and we pray, and when we pray with the time we spend in God's Word, He helps us to hear His voice. Those passages become less obscure, and we start to see how even those Old Testament passages those ones that seem like they were written for people thousands of years ago continue to speak to us today because God's purpose has not changed. God's plan has not changed. From the beginning of the earth, He intended for all to be saved. So at just the right time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, to take those of us who are slaves and to make us His sons and daughters. Merry Christmas, children of God. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have redeemed us from sin, death, and the devil. We thank you that you are with us always, that you are the one who has given us hope. We pray that in all times we would turn to you, trusting in you. Forgive us for those times when we do not see your hand at work in our lives. For those times when we are caught up in the chaos of our lives. Help us, Lord, to turn to you. To know your forgiveness. To know your promise. To know that you are our salvation. Lord, lead us that one day. 
we may know the miracle of life, new life we have with you in life eternal. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.